great because anyone who wanted to miss my remarks, which they probably should, um, can now arrive and basically be on time uh, to hear uh, my colleague Ilya as well as this wonderful panel. Um, I'm Jane Tiles, I'm director of the Humanities Initiative. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here today to what, in a lot of ways, is the culmination of a really great year uh, of our 13 fellows here at the initiative. Um, for those of you who, who don't know the kind of core of what we do here, um, uh, we have six um, faculty, six graduate fellows, and one postdoc fellow who join us around the table in this room uh, every Tuesday afternoon for two and a half hours to talk about their work in progress, to talk about kind of the humanities writ large, um, to talk about disciplinary homes and boundaries and, and exiles and, and, and topics that really reach across uh, a number of different projects, whether those projects have to do uh, with African music, um, with Santa Teresa, um, of Avila, um, with um, 20th century configurations of narrative space, um, of Siberian maps in the 19th century, and so forth. We've had, a, we've had an incredible range of projects this year uh, in what is uh, our seventh year uh, of the initiative here at NYU. So um, without further ado, I just want to really thank the three people, the three of our fellows this year who were really instrumental in driving a lot of these conversations and in creating uh, the space that we're in today for a kind of extended uh, version of that conversation with some very wonderful guests, uh, both from within NYU and from without, who you'll be meeting in the course of the afternoon. Uh, those three fellows who, again, have been wonderful companions along with the other ten. Um, Armar uh, gomez Bez, who's uh, at the table uh, and who will be introducing our first panel. Uh, Franco Baldasso, uh, sitting in the front row. And uh, Juan Sebastian de Vivo, who's sitting right here, uh, who's our postdoc fellow um, for uh, this year in the initiative. Um, and we're just delighted that the three of them have had the energy and the vision and the foresight to conceptualize today's uh, events. I'm also really grateful to the other fellows who will be participating today uh, in uh, our goings on, as well as all of those uh, of you who are coming from elsewhere to be part of our conversation on humanities, not as uh, failing, because they're not failing, but you know, as faltering, uh, and what we can do um, to uh, think about that, to address it, and maybe even to, um, to help. So without further ado, I want to introduce my, my colleague, um, India Kleber, who is a faculty member of the Department of Slavic uh, here at NYU, uh, who's been a terrific fellow um, this year working with us, and who will introduce uh, the conference in a somewhat more theoretical way. Um, am I audible with this? Is it better? I mean, better. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, so uh, um, on behalf of, uh, of our group of fellows here at the Humanities Initiative, I would like to welcome you to this very promising event, um, to thank the speakers and discussants uh, for answering our call and the audience for coming to participate. Um, I would also like to second Jane's uh, uh, gratitude to, uh, to Fra Franco, Mar, and Sebastian for organizing uh, for organizing this event behind the scenes and having it turn out so well, so far at least. Um, <laughs> yesterday, as, as we were saying our grudging uh, goodbyes uh, during our final official lunch, uh, many of us took the opportunity to thank Jane and Asha, Asha, um, uh, our directors, for bringing us together and allowing us to learn from each other throughout the year. Uh, I want to use this occasion to do this more publicly. Um, uh, and we're all grateful for your warmth and your vision in making this year together so enjoyable and productive for all of us. By way of an opening, I just uh, would like to say a couple of words on how the topic of this conference seems to me to have arisen from our uh, uh, weekly uh, uh, meetings. It was probably inevitable that the question of the place of the institutions and discourses of the humanities and society, this historically specific one and other societies and at other times, it was probably inevitable that this question formed a kind of ultimate horizon for many of our presentations and discussions. One way in which this implicit background became most starkly, starkly thematized was in the image of, or what is by now 
the topos of the humanities in crisis, besieged by countless managerial logics and needing to prove itself again and again in terms it has a hard time accepting. It seems to me, it seems intriguing then that uh, the conference in which our uh, meeting culminates, uh, meetings culminate, comes to be called When Humanities Falter. Reflecting on the title in this context, one might wonder if we are somehow suggesting that it is in some sense our own fault that we are being asked to justify our existence in terms of the profit motive. Uh, or to put it differently, can this reflex of self-chastisement be understood um, as a form of ritual compensation for what is in actuality a systemic powerlessness? When we ask ourselves as humanists to be vigilant about our practices and theories, are we internalizing the constraints that are being imposed on us from the outside? Or does posing the problem of the humanities in this way, in terms of a faltering and its dire consequences, ominously adumbrated by the relative adverb when, does this way of posing the problem display an awareness of a greater power than we are often comfortable admitting? the power to produce and reproduce the very logic in accordance with which we are asked, we are then asked to justify ourselves, but also to resist it. It seems to me that from this perspective, um, uh, that is from the position of awareness that both weakness and power can be predicated of the humanities to an alarming degree, the panels of today's conference can be said to arise out of three types of questioning uh, prominent in our discussions in the course of the year. First, the questioning of our disciplines as they posit conceptions of the human, always ready to fall back onto some implicit hierarchy of humanness and inevitably setting categorical limits, say in other biological species to be deployed or consumed, or in the world of inert objects to be mastered and possessed. Second, the interrogation of the humanities as a universal or global category that too quickly loses sight of the many national, cultural, and semantic boundaries it crosses and faces on the wings of a standardizing culture and education industry. A tendency, incidentally, of which those of us who teach or study at what is known as the Global Network University can come uh, to be all the more watchful. And finally, the fateful question of the humanities and violence of how the language of the humanities often finds itself traversed by power asymmetries, of how it turns out to be infinitely capable of rarefying and reinforcing those asymmetries, and of how it can lag behind them as they shift, so that the group may continue to invoke humanistic discourses in order to make sense of its position as a victim, while it has already moved on to become a perpetrator. Explicitly or not, it seems to me that we consistently return to these three forms of questioning, humanities and the human, humanities and the global, humanities and power. And now we are grateful to have here with us colleagues from across um, NYU and neighboring universities to continue and broaden this line of questioning. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan.
start by, by offering more thanks um, to the Humanities Initiative and its, and its director, Jane Tylus, who makes these sorts of spaces and, and conversations possible. And I especially want to thank Franco Maud and Juan Sebastian, the three organizers of the conference, for the invitation to speak, um, Jacques for uh, his response, and all of you for, for braving the, the deluge outside uh, to be here today. Your grace, see if you can stand and will help us now. But he doesn't deserve it, because he's the main reason for this beating. I never would have believed you took us now. I always thought he was the person to take statement and so peace of desire. Well, like they say, you need a long time to know a person, and nothing in this life is deserve it. It's a less than iconic moment in the story. Sancho Quixote of the Blaine Halpern having to abandoned his natural ways and customs 
did not ask permission of the donor, broke into a crest little shop, and went off to communicate his need to them. But the police, who apparently had more desire to save than anything else, greeted him with hooves and teeth, so that in a short while, his cinches broke and he was left naked without a sound. But what he must have regretted most was that the drovers, seeing the violence being done to their mare, hurried over with their staffs and hit him so many times that they knocked him to the ground. <coughs> The adventure is sandwiched between two other narratives of thwarted desire that move from the sublime to the ridiculous, or better, from the literary ideal to the most material. In the preceding chapter, the shepherdess Marcella, chased by would-be suitors, defends her desire to not desire men, instituting a queer trajectory aligned with freedom. In the chapter that follows, the mystery of the <coughs> of Quixote, the innkeeper's daughter, the servant girl of Manitotinus, and the mule lead to chaos and further beatings for the knight and his squire. In each of the three entangled episodes, desire is postponed, detoured, a heteronormative narrative interrupted and in a sense laid bare. Something perhaps to do with the pastoral literary scenes, these scenes that these scenes rewrite and profane, but also perhaps something to say about imperial desires for which the world was not to The episode also sometimes aligned or misaligned with what they're doing. Sancho, whose peaceable nature has at least a, a little to do with his desire to avoid pain, vows a blanket forgiveness for all past, present, and future offenses, regardless of who offends him. From now until the day I appear before God, I forgive all offenses that have been done or will be done to me, whether they are done, are being done, or will be done by a person high or low, rich or noble or common, without exception, and regardless of rank or position. Quixote, who predictably disagrees with Sancho, takes a different tack, but ends up in more or less the same place. He argues that, quote, injuries inflicted by the tools when happens to holding are not offenses, end quote, thus acquitting himself of any obligation to pay back in kind the pleasure he and Sancho have just received. So what concerns me this It's hard to know just what Cervantes was left with. Contemporary definitions of person don't offer much help. The La Rubia 1611 Spanish Dictionary, for example, the first of any modern language, defines person by citing Boethius's well-known definition. Natura es la que nadie individua substancia. A person is an individual substance of a rational nature. Substancia individua an end term, foreclosing further subdivision, and nature is not a rational being. Sancho's description may simply point to the extent to which Rosinante functions as a character in the novel, or maybe another instance of the kind of anthropomorphizing of force and donkey. But something else seems to be at play. I'm going to take a cue from Cervantes and leave the story hanging over 
Personhood is not perhaps explicit in anti-humanism, in anti but it is not altogether absent. In many ways, the current crisis might be said to go down to the question of work, the work of the world art education, determining the work of the person. And that it is faltered from value because the line of open learning potential and economic productivity is being strengthened. But a second, more provocative way. We might, all the same, consider possible conjugations of humanity and personhood in theory in order to think of what has been excluded and about how these exclusions write a history of violence. There's little question that the early monasteries saw the rise of new order practices, new taxonomies, aimed at policing or establishing or occasionally erasing lines of demarcation between human and non-human, between person and non-person. Most often, but also what we might consider a proto ethnoracial extension. Let me mark three of the limits against which personhood has been constructed, though there are more imaginable, including the natural world itself. Con I'm confessing failures. I should admit that one of the platonic forms of this paper that never materialized was traced, or would have traced, I guess, a conceptual history of personhood, one that was somehow capable of capturing almost boa like its broad disciplinary sweep. The classical Latin that is amassed even by an actor in a play, the juridical, the person of that which is interpolated by the law and recognized as having rights and duties under the law, but that need not be human, the grammatical, which my first chapter came up, the first, second, and third persons as respectively speaker, as a C, and as the other who is spoken about but not directly addressed, to the theological, the person of the Trinity, for example, to the philosophical. Humanism's human boundaries, however, I will name three variations on the radically different forms the animal, the divine, and the machine. Each represents or represented a face of the non human, if not exactly the non person. A machine, in its broadest sense, for example, the state or the corporation, could be legally constituted as an artificial person. Similarly, Christian divinity would foster divide and find it divided in an indivisible person. It is the animal that. Neither should 
reason or response or language or a sense of maturity or the ability to think or observe and judge or a sense in which they are powered the capacity to suffer. He writes, it may come one day to be recognized that the number of legs or the loss of the skin, the determination of the ultimate doctrine, are reasons equally insufficient as blackness of the skin to evaluate.
can easily take our cues clear from Cervantes, whose Castilian claim is a rich territory of doubt, of multiple perspectives that undermine the possibility of any single authoritative view of reality itself. The classic example of this perspectivism is the classic Yeri, Sancho's knowledge of him for the objects that he sees as the barber's ways to make plastic, and his master as the helmet Yeri must have emerged with Eric on the A crucial aspect the humor of Quixote is to revive the local prestige as its own book, very different from the possible dreamy nerds and mancha interpretation of the 20th century, but also its seriousness has to do with the way in which its protagonists are radically vulnerable. Unlike the heroes of the Chivalric novel, they wear the scars of their passage of history in their case. And I want to acknowledge that uh, Jane here, who not only wrote a, a brilliant book on Text that invites us to encounter. 
Um, I'm going to start off by, by suggesting, confessing that the principal figure of thought that, that is at work in Vivi's presentation seems to be politically and tactically problematic, which is a conversion seems to be a kind of debility or weakness into strength. Uh, debility or weakness here, failure, faltering of the humanities in the face of the positivistic onslaught of the standard discipline uh, views, could be registered as a confirmation of precisely what makes the standard discipline uh, superior fundable, uh, easily marketable, easily uh, seen to be uh, rational, rationally analyzable as well. <clears throat> so from a technical point of view, that seems to me a risk. It seems to me a risk to, to, to take this road. Um, is there also a companion philosophical risk Road of uh, uh, the, the, the failures or the faltering and then converting that into what is one of the definitive characteristics of the humanities. Um, on one hand, no. Right? On, on one hand, no, there's no, there's no particular risk to, to asserting that the set of determinants that Gigi mentioned, which have doubt, uh, <coughs> uh, decentering, Stabilization, irony, uh, imagination without borders, sympathy without borders, empathy as well. These seem to me ethically uh, entirely uh, positive things, epistemologically useful, and so on. So I would say that on, on one description, all of the, the terms that line up with the humanities on this description that we should recover for as its functions of the humanities. And the production of doubt, dialogue, irony, all of these seem to be uh, rather, rather good. But I have a kind of Nietzschean bone in my body that makes me worry about the assertion of weakness. And to remember the wonderful lines in places like the genealogy of morals and many other places where Nietzsche smells the stench of, uh, of the slave morality. So what, what I will try to suggest in the next minute or two, or three, or four, or six, uh, uh, is, is uh, a way, both tactically and philosophically, of uh, conceiving this faltering or debility or vulnerability that is less likely to uh, allow itself to fall, fall into the, the philosophical problematic of Nietzschean suspicion uh, of debility as, as simply the morality of the, of the oppressed <coughs> converted into somehow the, the slave morality that then asserts itself as the, uh, the good um, on one side. And then on the other side, the, the tactical problem of seeming to replicate simply the, the weakness, the fuzziness that the STEM disciplines always so what would this alternative be? And I think that Gigi has pointed one direction, which is to a, a reconception of the notion of person in the, uh, in the juridical domain, in the domain of everyday um, conversation, in the domain of, of the possession or not possession of rights, uh, and so on. That, I think, is a very fruitful way to think of what the humanities might allow us to do. It, it goes some strong distance towards thinking, allowing us to think about <clears throat> environmental issues, about animal rights issues in ways that, that are, uh, are not susceptible of critique, either from the STEM positivistic side or from the philosophical Nietzschean side. But what I'd like to do is just spend a minute or two thinking about this fantastic Goya image that is at the top of the, the poster, and to think about whether the faculty of the is something that we could take on for the humanities as a, uh, a kind of 
drive that will give us a positive definition for what we what we do uh, that could stand up to the kind of both practical and philosophical scrutiny that we're getting from STEM disciplines as well as the philosophically Lucian disciplines that might be critical of, of the conversion of ability into into um, a kind of an ethics of the good. So what would this mean? Well observe with me that the Description on this print of Goya's is a perfect example of what we might call a philological antiphony or uh, a, a grammatical uh, undecidability. We don't know which of the two senses the, the phrase "el sueño de la razón produce monstruos" is to be taken in. Of course, we don't know whether this means that when reason is not being reasonable, then we have uh, monsters, um, that is, the dream is the place where reason does not apply. Uh, but we also, the, the Spanish grammar makes it completely feasible to think that when reason is being most itself, that is, in the process of sleeping, when the truth of reason is revealed, And I could, you know, you could, you could see uh, the humanity <coughs> lining itself up very comfortably with either of these things, uh, with um, the lack of reason, if by reason you think the, the, you imagine scientific reason, the production of facts, the production of demonstrable facts, and I remind you that demonstration, demonstrosity, share the root uh, to mostrare, to show, to, to produce in that way. So, humanities as non-demonstrable, that is, they are the other, the, the, the monster to reason, they're the monster to, to the scientific uh, imagination, uh, and to the scientific procedure, and should qua monster be set out as part of the world of fables and mythologies on one side. On the other side, one could say that the humanities claim, can claim, can assert the claim to be the truth demonstrate something, you are showing a monster somehow. So how would you do this? I don't want either of these solutions uh, for myself, uh, frankly. I think that, um, that they're good, they're okay, but what I'd rather retain for the humanities is the production of, a, of the monstrosity of a sentence that points in both directions. Right? It cannot be philologically denied. Therefore, it is a fact of historical philology that this is a grammatical undecidability, that we cannot make a determination between these two uh, directions in which the phrase might go. Right? So we can, as humanists, produce a fact. It is a fact of philology that this grammatical uh, overdetermination and, and uh, uh, undecidability is an, a, a quality of this second. We cannot allow ourselves to drift into non-factuality uh, of, which, of which we could be, uh, you know, any kind of second-grade relativist could, could poke a hole in us uh, if we did that. No. About this phrase, we could say with a absolute degree of certainty that this is an undecidable antiphony and, uh, and that therefore it is a monster, if you want, in the field of concepts. It is something that doesn't fit. That it does, doesn't fit because it's a bad concept. It's two good concepts uh, pointing in different directions that coincide in one concept uh, and one definition of what reason is. This, I think, is what the humanities need to hold on to. This relation between the production of defective concepts uh, and the factuality of the domain in which those defective concepts are produced. We seems to me to be, uh, to go that direction is indeed to fall into either of these two domains, you see, in, in, especially if it's a domain uh, in which the STEM disciplines will be, will be eating our lunch. If we give up the factuality of the humanities, uh, 
uh, we are completely busy, politically, tactically, and also philosophically. So what would it mean on the philosophical side <coughs> not to give up the, the positivity of fact, the philological fact? Um, it would mean um, returning at every instant to the domain in which the philologically epistemologous constructions are produced and showing Turn then to to the, the opening to say so. Would this help us to return to failure as one of the definitive modes of the humanities? I think that it, it would, uh, in as much as it gives us a purchase on the concept of failure <coughs> as it's deployed in the STEM disciplines. STEM disciplines are also
fascinating that you bring up Nietzsche because I, you know, and I don't know to what extent I've actually I can formulate something coherent out of this, but I mean, it, it strikes me that whereas um, there seems to, to be this conception of, of altering as an opening up of a critical space to consider, to reflect, um, to, to conceptualize yourself in relation to the world. Uh, I think, in a way, you were pointing to that as what the humanities can actually bring forward. So in a way, it's almost, you know, handing the tools to conceptualize your own place uh, in relation to the world based on these moments of uncertainty, really. Um, and then reca <clears throat> excuse me, recasting it in this Nietzsche narrative is fascinating because, you know, the distinction between, you know, the barbarous and the slave of morality is really one of reflection. So, you know, the, the barbarian does not reflect the barbarian acts. Um, and it's, uh, it's a failure, really, to, to open up reflection because it hinders your acting. Acting is this kind of blowing nest that just happens as you kind of pummel through the world, right? Um, so I wonder uh, to what extent um, this notion of reflection or this space of critical uh, reconceptualization of the world as opposed to this kind of uh, agentic view of action without reflection might function in relation to how we conceptualize the humanities and what we're supposed to teach and what people are supposed to value that we teach. Thank you. Um, do you want to um, add I, 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 One of the ways that I was thinking of it, not with the, the kind of Nietzschean paradigm, but was um, along, along the lines of the, the kind of Cartesian reading of, of the animal machine in terms of reaction or, or response. seem technical questions and seem destined to uh, answer in that register. We can do that at the same time. Whereas the humanities ask the ethical questions, the questions of, of, of right, the questions of history, should we do X or Y? Right? Uh, so the, the, uh, if you line that up with action and reflection, then you have, I think, a, a, a classic say, one can turn that initial arrangement, action, reflection, uh, we can do this, should we do this, that, those, those two orders of questions, into things that have a kind of looping characteristic, which say, well, we should ask questions about action without first asking questions about the, sh the should question, and we can't ask should questions or answer them without having the possibility before us, otherwise they're entirely vacuous and useless. So we're simply in a kind of circulatory system that leaves us with our hands for the moment as well. Not so good. Nietzsche's more interested, I think, in the, the point at which these two sets of questions, while equally uh, demanding on us, are not, sort of cannot be put into a circulatory system. So you have to, uh, on one description, you have to make a decision between these two sorts of questions. On the other one, you have to uh, move from one to the other out grounding the movement from one to the other on either side, but rather you know, in a kind of typical 
falling or, or tripping or faltering from one to the other, right? Uh, so that's, I think, where he goes uh, with this, that it, on, on these two orders of question, which line up so nicely with, with these two different kinds of constructions of action and reason or reflection, he says they are not reducible to one another. They don't lead necessarily from one to the other where we should be. <laughs> we're going to bring that violence in a little later. <laughs> uh, that's a really tough question, Jeff. I, um, I have to say that I, I would never have confessed to even the slightest aspect of positivism five years ago, but I, I'm becoming more interested in that recently. Um, I, I think that you see that there are these. system and can be made to work according to its rules. And this would be on the side of logic. Uh, as you correctly saw, that's what underlies the, the, the grammatical paradigm. Yeah. On the other one, on the other side, there's the, the test of the, of the event, the test of the outcome. If I can convince you to do X and you do X, uh, that's not a logical
So we have sort of the, the, the um, effects within the story, but of course they, they grow out of the story as well. We can also say that it produces, the chest itself is of course um, producing or um, uh, kind of a, a, a sense of problem with historicism in the scope of um, the questioning of, uh, of the tomb. But, but it is also uh, producing uh, a certain reading of On the other hand, we have a new mentis like only to Nietzsche, for example, uh, Nietzsche, I think, to chance. Uh, okay, it's not saying that, but, but also, I find it like, also fascinating the fact that uh, this set of uh, knowledge, or different knowledge, uh, can produce or are prone uh, to produce monstrosities, monsters. And I find it so fascinating that I have to surprise say, hey, I'm just teaching monsters. And stuff like that. Because, uh, these are um, like figures that go beyond the, the, what the quality or what the political aspect of, the, of our teaching or uh, yeah, uh, our set of knowledge is also already known. In a way. So, one kind of scene is very, very uh, you know, uh, traditional trend that can later to be preserved because it's like the new music values. Maybe um, what humanities might do, um, and, and to go back to you know, the first is this you know, stem that I, I know I'm turning the stem now into a, a kind of um, straw man, which is which is entirely false or with a grain of salt. Um, but is is precisely to, um, to to question a kind of regulation, you know, to question a kind of um, citizen that does not uh, that does not question that. 
both categories are a little bit invaded one by the other. You know, because part of you know, where, where we situate the monster, I mean, the monsters uh, are ultimately a question of taxonomy, right? It's what exceeds or what can't fit into one category or uh, another. And so it is, it is put out there as, um, as a figure of thought among, among many other things, but that also has been put to all kinds of political uses. somehow already um, a little bit haunted by by these monsters or by the possibility of this anarchical turn, you know, as opposed to a citizen that um, is much more um, altruistic. Um, positive uh, positive are also monsters. That, that, that was cheap. Yeah. I, I reached back to that. <laughs> 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 if I could make another point. same I think is not true yet or perhaps even possibly in the humanities. Uh, how we produce our facts is precisely something that we don't have in common, I think, uh, entirely with the, you know, with the said discipline. And um, I like the, the concept of the anarchic if we apply it not just to the outcome or to the political doesn't mean that science doesn't produce anarchism also, right? And that's, I think, where we could intervene in our conceptualization of the STEM discipline and then say, where you, the STEM discipline, are producing in ways that are surprising, that's when you're getting humanistic, right? So we, we could actually take over the STEM discipline and show them the, the monstrous dream of their core, which is anarchic production that is at a, at a kind of slant with the mode of production that they bring to themselves and prior to that. I'm just going to add something, just uh, ripping off what, what Josh just said. And you talked about the, the mode of production, which I think is important too. But, but part of, I think, the, the error in a kind of, um, I don't know, self-flagellation of is the idea that, that we um, should somehow emulate the kind, or not, not the kind, but, but the product, fact. You know, I, I think this 
precisely what um, what we're producing in the humanities is, is something very different. That does not mean we throw out sort of that they do the bathwater of, of a kind of positivism, but, but that what we're um, getting is something different. And, and just to, to go back to, to the threat, now there's, there's another um, sort of uh, anthropological um, and in Sueño. Sueño, of course, is, is both the sleep of reason, but also the dream of <laughs> at the start, like, <laughs> and 